Thank you everyone for taking part and welcome to all our guests I can see joining the meeting. Um, I do hope you feel like getting on board and asking some questions, whether that's by typing it in the chat down the side or actually getting on the mic. We've got some talking points to go through first and then we'll take questions from uh, the audience. So to introduce myself, I'm Jane O'Neill. I'm the editor of Commercial Interior Design Magazine. We're the definitive magazine and website for the region's design community. Uh, thank you for joining us for the 14th edition of the Cosentino City Live. Today, we're going to be talking about spa and wellness spaces and how new hygiene and safety protocols are going to be shaping their design in the future. I'll be moderating the discussion. And on the panel, you can see we have three experts from the industry. Uh, we have Ingo Schweider, who is the founder and CEO of Goku Hospitality and Managing Director of Haworth HTL Health and Wellness. Um, they've led the design, development and operation of some of the most iconic wellness hospitality venues around the world, including the spa at our very own Address Sky View in Dubai. We also have Assistant Professor Milani Karani, Director of Studies for Interior Design at Haria Watt University. Some of the projects she worked on uh, as a designer include in Dubai include Etihad Mall, Times Square Mall, retail branches of Barclays Bank and some luxury villas in Emirates Hills. Finally, uh, Martin R. Goldman, who founded the bespoke spa and wellness design consultancy A-Spa in 1983, together with his team of architects and designers, Martin's have created superior quality, profitable concepts for the luxury hospitality and wellness sector and among his award-winning portfolio projects for Hilton, Sheraton, uh, Marriott, uh, and Accor Hotels. Uh, we're very pleased to have them all with us, such three, knowledge, three knowledgeable people, uh, and I'll be helping steer them through the questions um, for today. But obviously, we'd like to hear from the audience as well, so feel free to chip in at any point, and we'll take those questions at the end. So um, now... We're speaking about the to focus on the wellness sector in Dubai. Gyms and spas here have just started to cautiously open up, I think, which is in line with what's happening in the rest of the world. I wonder if you could share with us how wellness spaces is responding to coronavirus design wise. What's in that new toolkit? Martin, would you like to kick us off with this one? Yeah, um, yeah. thank you, Jane, and nice to be on the platform talking. Um, good afternoon to everyone. So it, what what we're seeing right now is um, we're we're seeing two two um, chapters opening up. The first chapter is those spas that are operational and um, and working, and are about to be opened in the let's say during the the course of this year. And then we're seeing the design of new projects for 2021, 22, 23. So totally different uh, scope. So let's come to the first one, and that is the spas that have opened up in Dubai and most of most of the spas around the world. We're seeing some very quick, uh, uh, let's say, retrofits in the hydrothermal areas, um, the installation of um, bacteria and virus removing filters, which comes from the hospital industry. Uh, we've teamed up with an, a German company to introduce that. Um, we see the installation of uh, UVC lights throughout the spa corridors, changing rooms, facilities. Uh, treatment rooms, etc., so that UV lights can then be switched on at night when the spa is empty and not inhabited, and the whole area can get dosed with uh, ultraviolet C uh, disinfection. And then also we we are seeing then again back in the hydrothermal area, um, shock chlorination uh, almost on a daily basis now, but all automated, so it definitely gets done. It's not reliant on human um, uh, intervention, and that's just to give our clients the peace of mind um on on what they're using and how they're using it um in terms of treatment rooms um i think right now we've got a number of suppliers of treatment beds who have brought out uh, these masks to protect both the, the client and the therapist uh, i think this is what we're going to have to live with for now and um i think our most challenging area in in the entire spire is our changing rooms which is a high density um area of client exchange which um, they're trying to deal with in, in different uh, ways. But I think Inga probably has a better answer to that than I do from an operational point of view. No, yeah, I really, uh, you noted it all, <laughs> very comprehensive. I think one of the nice things is that the new spas are not anymore in any basement. I think people now have understood that daylight opening windows, uh, 
and a much more uh, indoor-outdoor relationship is very, very important. It was always very difficult, Martin, uh, until, I don't know, until not so long ago, to convince people to not make it in the basement and to put it on top of the building on the site uh, and have the private entrance and so. I think by now uh, that message is much more clearer. So I think that's one of the uh, additional positives which are there. But I think one of the, the, the the challenges are older facilities. Uh, older facilities sometimes don't have the money, they don't have the, the capex budgets uh, to do those retrofits. And I don't know what's going to happen to those facilities because the client are going to demand certain changes as you as you noted so well. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure that all facilities have the petty cash and have the stamina to go through and, uh, and, and make those uh, changes. Thank you. Um, so if we're looking at the challenges this, that these spaces are facing from a design perspective, I mean, what, what are the, maybe not for the retrofits, but for the new project, projects, what are the biggest challenges coming up? Uh, Melanie, well, maybe you could share with us what you'd be coaching students through if they were tackling spa design projects. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for in inviting me. And it's a great discussion panel to be a part of. Um, so. For the spas of the future, I think um, like we've spoken about, like Martin's spoken about as well, I think the locker space or the common space design is what uh, would be really focused on because your rooms are uh, individual or, you know, you, you go in cup as a pair. So there is that isolation there, but it's your common spaces such as your sauna spaces or your hydrotherapy pools or your locker room. How do you manage to keep those clean? And how do you manage to make sure there aren't too many people and they're not going to be worried about cross-contamination, uh, cross not necessarily from the staff, but from the patient. And how do you, you know, um, keep the space clean? How often does somebody come and clean the space? But uh, also the finishes, that how do you keep uh, make sure that you're using the finishes that can be sanitized or kept clean? And you, you make sure you use uh, materials that are anti-microbial, anti-bacterial, and, and they can primarily be sanitized. Thank you. Ingo, what have you seen coming through from the uh, um, future projects? But, things but, that are still on the pipeline. Yeah, what I saw and what, what I see or, or saw and what I like very much, there's many more interest in garden setting of spas, uh, uh, that really spas are entire outdoor or to a very large extent outdoor, which didn't happen before because there was always this need for having everything in air conditioned spaces. And of course, there are certain parts, uh, you cannot make a retail, uh, a retail spa product uh, department somewhere in the, in, the, in the blazing sun, those products would be gone in a day. But there's many more interest now to really create indoor outdoor spaces and have a large portion and a lot of playground and a lot of circulation and a lot of event spaces, pop-up spaces, indoor outdoor restaurants, where the outdoors becomes much more uh, prominent than it earlier was. And I think that is one of the positives uh, of the present situation uh, that people have understood that uh, outside is not only one doesn't get infected so fast, but more importantly, uh, how important vitamin D is and how important it is to, to move around. And uh, and therefore, so I think that's another very positive of, of, of those days. I mean, there's a lot of negatives right now. There's a substantial amount of cost, which are coming towards the operators right now. Um, um, that can be six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars or euros, depends where you are, uh, per treatment, which is substantial. Um, it represents sometimes five, six, seven, ten percent uh, of the cost. Um, but I, I think there are a couple of very positive elements, and I think this is again one of the positive elements um, uh, embracing the industry right now. Do you think we're going to see trends in changing in how the customers also use spas as well? I think Martin, we previously spoke about, you know companies looking at retrofitting what had formerly been meeting spaces and using those as spas that they could be rented out to families or allocated to people to be used in a family group rather than individual customers? 
Um, what, what we see is there's quite a bit of uh, villa developments coming. I mean, villa developments were, were always very in and very important. But uh, there's an interest now because one wants to be together with this group of friends, with a group of families, or uh, the two or three generations. And there's more and more interest of uh, uh, having your secluded own little world within a larger resort or within uh, within a hotel, which again serves the purpose of creating communication, serves the purpose of uh, togetherness, spending time together that's very meaningful. But at the same time, I'm with my own and I know with who I am. Uh, that means there's no chance of a virus easily moving in if I'm surrounded by hundreds of people who I don't know and don't know what they have done. So th those are the, the changes. I can see this here also in Thailand. Um, in Thailand has a huge amount of villas uh, for rent and uh, normally in the in the off season uh, they, they wouldn't be rented and perhaps in the peak season in the winter time in the in, in August for three, four or five weeks they're full. Now you cannot go to any beach resort and find a villa here because all the villas are booked all the time every weekend where entire groups go out there and say this is my villa for the weekend. There's a cook, there's a chef, there's a massage therapist. There's six, seven, eight, nine, ten bedrooms, and the entire group of friends and family members stays together. So there's a shift in design, there's a shift in demand, and then there's a shift in what the people buy and their what at the end is the money. And when we create spaces, we have to fulfill the needs of the uh, developers to ensure that they have a profitable product. So it all works together. It sounds like we're also seeing a shift in consumer behavior as well, which I think it would influence how these spaces have to be created. Um, Martin, I think your connection went off a little bit there, but um, we spoke previously about how you mentioned that some hotels, are, some hotel clients are wanting to retrofit meeting spaces and now create kind of family spa areas. Is that a yeah. trend that you can see emerging in the industry? Well, I, I think this is going to, it's certainly happening with one uh, one group of uh, hotel chain we're talking to, and, and just to bring everyone up to speed and put uh, get us all on the same page, um, they have a thousand square meter conferencing facility and a very small spa. And um, the conversation was very, very much what, what Inga was saying. Um, this uh, GM just turned around and said, we're not going to fill up this conferencing facilities for the next two to three years. Um, what what options have we got? And we came to came up with taking that thousand square meter area and breaking it up into five uh, family spa units. So you know, a family would book into the hotel and then they would book that their family spa for three hours, six hours, eight hours. And mm -hmm. they'd have the therapist come there. It would be their yeah. family therapist. They could order um, uh, food into the spa area. You'd have a thermal area, sauna, steam, Perfect. sensory showers. Uh, hydro pool, massage area, relaxation area, and it, that is then for that family or for even a company. If a company is doing a, a promotional outing, or or if it was a um, a, a, a stag party or a, a when a hen party, they could book that area out. It's being disinfected. It's not being uh, um, used by other people who are totally strange to that group of people. And I I think. Um, this will be the um, the probably the um, the way forward until we get a vaccine, and then once we have a vaccine, I think it'll be life back to normal until the next COVID twenty comes around and we have to rethink everything again. Right. But um, I think breaking down a hotel spa into smaller units that generate a, a larger num amount of money yeah. um, is possibly a very interesting game. Uh, a game changer for the uh, hospitality industry. Yeah. So Martin, you're doing this in Portugal, you just mentioned, right? Yeah, we've got one client in Portugal and we have a client um, in Malta as well, uh, where we're doing these these two options, um, right. breaking it down. And yeah. and then what we've, we've also done is we are just about to launch a pop-up uh, sauna um, yeah. for the coastline. Uh, we have 14 degrees uh, here in the water right now. But we, we, I think the, the, the mentality is bring the spa, bring wellness to the people rather than the people having to go and find it. And this is a paradigm shift we're going to have to deal with. I know it doesn't resonate with you sitting in Dubai and the Middle East where it's 50 degrees outside. But um, I, I was in Qatar in, in um, January and February of this year with beautiful weather, you know, blue sky, clear, lovely, cool 15 degrees. So it, it would work there. 
And if you if you go back and you listen to Dr. Mark Cohen or read his um, uh, article on turning the heat up on COVID-19, he yeah. promotes saunering and, and sauna bathing, um, you know, which is pro probably one of the best things we can do right now in, inside the wellness uh, realm. The reason why I ask you where, you where you're doing this is we just got an inquiry here in Asia to take a very prominent hotel, moving it from 700 rooms to 300 rooms and taking a 2,000 square meter ballroom and making an entire wellness center out of this. Perfect. Now, yeah. two years ago, nobody ever would have thought about it. <laughs> they would have said, let me squeeze my rooms inside and squeeze the spa. No, they say, listen, you know, so that's an interesting thing that that happens in different parts yeah. of the world. It is beautiful. And I, I think it's going to have tremendous success. I, I really do. Because, you know, even if I'm living here and um, I have my personal wellness regime, which is running in the morning and, and swimming, etc., I can take my family and we can go and book a, a, a family spa for the morning, for the afternoon or for the evening. And um, yeah, it's uh, as you said, two years ago, it would have been unheard of. You've been thrown out the door. Um, but it, it's amazing. It, yeah. This is probably positive connotation of COVID-19 that we're seeing, yeah. uh, one of the few positive ones, but I think a very interesting one, and I think one that will be here to stay for a long time. I think another one which is coming up, um, you know, there was too much luxury in the wellness business and everything was designed to perfection and everything was designed with the most expensive uh, materials. And I clearly see that there's a more democratic approach to matters coming along the way. Uh, it is uh, literally, if you want to give it stars, everything from two, three, four stars, you find now uh, as much interested or you find even more interest in that than in only the luxury products. And I think that's a very good one because it's going to uh, ensure that many more people ha will have access to those facilities, will utilize yeah. the facilities, uh, in, then in the future, better immune system, be fitter, be wiser, be more conscious, and all of those good things. So I think, again, you know, we can always complain all day long about how bad COVID is and what we missed and what we didn't get and whatever kind of excuses we want to we give. But there is a lot of good things as well which is coming out of this. And I think um, a, a part of that is that a, a wider part of the population will have in the future access to those facilities. Um, there's a couple of uh, onsens which opened in Bangkok over the last uh, few years, and quite frankly, the the more most democratic one, the most accessible one, has the highest occupancy. You know, and they're charging 20 bucks to go inside there and participate in a couple of saunas and onsens, and I mean that's unheard of. You know, and and that is now happening, and that's beautiful. That's a, that's a good aspect of this very tragic and not so fortunate situation we're in. Well, I, I, I think what what COVID, to back up what you just said, um, COVID-19 has, has brought to the forefront that wellness is for everyone. It's no longer a luxury product. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we see, you know, young kids dying of COVID-19. We see uh, healthy sports players. I have a very good friend in South Africa who's actually, you know, intensive care for six weeks uh, on ventilators. Um, the last person I would th have thought could have uh, got it to that position. We see elderly people. So, you know, now uh, there's this that has brought the the brought it to our attention that we need to be healthy. We need to look after our bodies. And I think there's a second thing, a subliminal thing there, and that is if we look at the the cost of healthcare, it's just a vertical graph that's going straight up right now. The cost of healthcare around the world is just exorbitant, and we have to truncate that that graph and bring it down and make it affordable by everyone. But we also need, we just can't go to the doctor and say, give me a pill so I can lose weight. No, if you want to lose weight, you need to stop eating. You need to take up yeah. sport. Um, I just can't go to the gym and over one week become an incredible triathlete. I need to work on it. And I yeah. think this has brought this to the forefront and it, it, it will help our, our industry tremendously, really tremendously. And I think it'll what it'll do is it'll pull the, the, the spa and wellness industry a little bit out of the shade of the hospitality industry and it'll make it mainstream and um, that that's going to be very good. So it'll it'll see both things. It'll see um, uh, mainstream wellness coming up, but it'll also see the hospitality side having to improve their their game and, um, you know, 
as you said, get away from this high end, very fancy, very expensive uh, delivery, which we don't really need. We need we need results. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting to talk about high end and luxury when Malani and I are here in Dubai, where obviously high end and luxury is pretty much that. That's the baseline. Milani, I was wondering if you, when the students are, uh, are putting their projects together, how uh, how are they encouraged to tackle, or how could you look at the, the the aspect of budget spas and budget wellness? What's the design considerations from the academia side of things? Because they're the next future, the future generation of designers that could be designing these these budget wellness spas. Um, it's interesting that you asked that question. Well, currently we've not really been looking at uh, budgeting. Students are re usually been asked to go crazy with concept because the primary I idea in university or when you're learning is for us to teach them how to come up with concept design rather than trying to look at you know how practically it can be executed. It is funny that a lot of students do tend to ask do I have a budget? Do I have to walk around a budget? Is there a suggested budget? But with the way things are turning and the way things are changing, a lot of students uh, autonomously look at budget. So they want to try and find a budgeted solution. And it's an interesting aspect that we could look at introducing in the next couple of academic years that you know you can walk around affordable and materials which are which promote um, cleanliness or uh, antimicrobial materials and how you can because uh, we need to have it designed well and be comfortable and since we're talking about wellness allow for wellness so um, it can't be too driven just by a concept design it mm -hmm. has to filter out to ergonomics and things like uh, how do you make your client or your user comfortable like these oh. natural light, green spaces, there is a lot more awareness that connectivity to nature is uh, it's important. And in spaces where the temperature touches 50 degrees, how do you bring that outdoors indoors? Um, where it's about the, the placement almost. Which sides can you open up? Which sides can you not open up since uh, some sides tend to be cooler. Some sides, if you have glass on that side, tend to attract more heat. So you want to avoid things like the south facade in spaces like Dubai. So these are the kind of things that you know uh, designer students would be looking at. But yeah, definitely budget would be something interesting. That's interesting to hear. They don't. They the, the it's about the concept more, and then the budget comes second. So I guess the budget's something you learn about when you get into the design industry and you start putting your skills into practice. And that's when the budgets come into it. Have we seen um, Ingo? Um, maybe have you seen an effect on client budgets brought about by COVID, but also the need to to spend and adapt their wellness spaces? Yeah, I mean. Um... My company, as you may know, is involved and does all the work for Amala, right? Uh, Amala yeah. is in Red Sea. It's a huge... It's yeah, a the Saudi Giga project. 16 billion bucks, right? I mean, we we uh, reviewed uh, in great detail of what to do there in order to rework certain spaces. But luckily, we already in the beginning developed a very sustainable um, very much uh, biophilic design oriented product there. So that, that was good. Um, but I don't think it has to be expensive and money has to be spent disproportional to the effect in order to create something which has uh, resilient uh, biophilic design at its core. Um, sometimes, I think many times, and, and quite frankly, in the Middle East where you sit, often um, finishes are selected uh, for the sake of having something expensive there, which even only half of the population understands what you have utilized there or what you have applied uh, to a finish. Uh, but it, it, is, it has a certain cost to it and a certain allure to it, right? I, I think there's much more consciousness now uh, coming uh, towards us um, in, in utilizing finishes uh, and materials 
which are smart and which are intelligent and which are local, which are authentic as our spas and our wellness spaces need to be authentic to the location. And I think there is a shift, like there's a shift in general in terms of the consciousness of how to approach a project. Um, and, and, and I think, uh, again, that's one of the positives that uh, one doesn't look only as how glamorous I can be and how much sparkle I can have and how much gold and whatever I can I can utilize, but how can I be real and true to the meaning? And, you know, wellness and health um, is never about uh, marble and gold. Uh, it is about, uh, you know, what you do in the spaces, how you utilize the spaces, and then, you know, the tactileness of many materials, uh, you know, a good piece of wood is cheaper than an incredible piece of marble, which is cold and perhaps not as uh, tactile and warm and kind and good to yourself. I mean, this that was an extreme example, but um, so I, I think there is a there is a consciousness, there is a change in how to approach, what to utilize those spaces. There is going to be a more realistic, authentic approach to how to fit those uh, facilities out and. Again, that's a good one. Thank you. I mean, this is a, a trend that we see, and I'm guessing if projects are rolling out now, these are trends that are emerging. How long do you think this is going to, is this a, a long-term thing, or is this um, something we're going to see you know, over yeah. the, the lifespan of COVID-19 only? Well, I, I don't believe, uh, unfortunately, I think COVID will last a bit longer than many people believe. While I also believe, uh, like Martin said, there is a, there is a, a, a vaccination will come out of some sort or some sort of drugs will will appear on the market, which will help us to overcome and to reduce the inflammation and reduce the uh, the, 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 the strong uh, illness characters of COVID. Right. I, I don't think um, it's like AIDS. Uh, it's like, you know, Ebola. It has never gone. Um, and uh, so I, I, I believe that COVID will be with us. And given what we have done to the world and given how many people we are on this earth uh, and how many people are now, uh, you know, uh, living in very tight uh, downtown spaces um, and, and how close we got to animals and all kinds of things, there will be there will be more outbreaks of some sort, you know, so that uh, and, and, and there, therefore, uh, I'm not sure that we totally eliminate this. Therefore, I believe uh, a more conscious approach, and I believe um, that through this epidemic or pandemic, sorry, uh, that uh, many more people have understood that they need to do more uh, preventive measures for themselves than they have done earlier. And therefore, uh, there will be a more uh, democratic approach to many things. And therefore, to answer the question, long story short, um, uh, COVID, COVID uh, is, is here to stay. Perhaps it's going to be called something else, uh, but it will never go away like AIDS and Ebola and many others haven't gone away, you know. Um, we're just going to deal with it a bit better. Uh, we have understood it and, um, you know, some people will not cry about masks anymore and, you know, all of those kind of things that all will become a bit more um, normal, but yeah. It certainly sounds like it's presenting opportunities and potential as well as um, obviously some massive and tragic challenges. Uh, I wonder, Martin, do you want to touch on uh, what opportunities you've seen come out of this? We spoke about family spa rooms, but I wonder if because of travel restrictions, has there been an increase in the domestic market in terms of where people want to set up spas and where, how far they're willing to travel to get to one? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think... There, there is a there is a cloud with a silver lining here, and you know this uh, staycation has become a big thing. Um, of course, being Portuguese or based in Portugal, um, we we were disappointed with the news about the the air bridge from the UK. It's a huge population for us, but as Ingo said earlier on, um, all these villas in Thailand have have suddenly been booked up because people still want to go on holiday, but they want to be in smaller clusters. And the government is telling us that they have to be in smaller clusters. So what we've started to see in Portugal is that this, what we call turismo rural, rural tourism, have, have been absolutely sold out and, um, and they are doing extremely well. 
a 200 uh, key hotel, 300 key hotel on the on the coast, Al Gulf Coast is not doing so well. They've only got 10 percent, 20 percent occupation during the the month of June, and I, I don't think it's going to uh, go up very much more. Uh, sadly speaking, but but that's the reality, and I I do agree with Ingo that uh, this is here to stay for quite a long time. Um, the, the, we we have a, a couple of years of very challenging economic um, uh, turbulence ahead of us. But what what has what we've found is is that these smaller uh, tourism areas have have started to show a great interest on um, quick delivery, mobile uh, spa, sauna, steam, hydro pool. Uh, treatment room uh, facilities, and and that's what we're working on in a very local basis for the the Portuguese and Spanish market. So that that is a massive opportunity. Milani, what opportunities do you think are presenting themselves here in Dubai? Because we're, I think we're such a unique climate here for the wellness industry. Um, I think a lot of what is appearing elsewhere in the world, back to basics and that kind of thing, just wouldn't, I don't know if there's an appetite for here to design wise. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what trends could you see coming up in Dubai over the short term future for design? I think in Dubai, um, I would, the, the trend shift would be that a lot more organized or a lot more companies are trying to incorporate wellness into the office and of offer wellness for their staff, as well as for their, you know, um, other communities. So bringing things like uh, workout spaces into the office space, um, well-being and making sure that your desk and your chair is more ergonomic and that you have an opportunity to talk about mental health well-being, physical health well-being, and perhaps, who knows, we might have a small dedicated spa space offered in uh, offices, which um, if you're not comfortable, like you said, Martin, to go somewhere, if the spa could come to the offices, um, it could be a solution. The other, <laughs> sorry, feedback. <laughs> the other idea probably would be, because it's too hot to be outside, well, definitely in the summer, perhaps uh, during the winter, you have more outdoor wellness and well-being spaces because uh, we do see the month of there's a month dedicated for fitness in Dubai where you have all sorts of 30 by 30 challenges which start after November. Yeah, the Dubai fitness challenge. Dubai. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry, blanked out there. Mm. So uh, you see a lot more um, fitness awareness, but then uh, making it more accessible to every office is, I think, something that we can see uh, happening. Uh, I think what will come will be a much wider array and variety of wellness communities. I believe um, it is absolutely time now, instead of building only high rises, see gas into the sky, which all look the same, many times don't even have a balcony or a terrace, uh, that there is going to be an interest in living again on the ground or one, two floors on the ground, uh, to go into a garden, a small one or a large one, depending on one's interest and pocket, uh, and have, um, you know, not only a very manicured, beautiful lawn, but perhaps a trim trail throughout the entire development where I can go to the supermarket and get fit on the way over there or on the way back, uh, or perhaps not with my bags, but, you know, to, to do things uh, uh, where, where the entire community is, is more fitness oriented. I, I don't, um, uh, I haven't seen this in the Middle East, but I can tell you in North America and in Asia and in Europe, that's already, it exists in pockets and I think it becomes much more popular um, uh, my company, we bought uh, three years ago uh, America's oldest hot spring and we bought the land next door and we're trying now to put a wellness community up there. Uh, it's very difficult to get permits in California. It takes, takes some time. It's, it's not as easy as in other parts of the world. But um, long story short, living together with organic uh, food uh, around you or living in a semi- uh, uh, wooded foresty area, uh, but still as a community and having sports and fitness and 
pools and related. Therefore, the community at large, this means one, 200 houses, who all can participate, um, or having simple design elements like uh, not only everybody facing the garden, but there's a porch again. And I sit on my porch with my newspaper and uh, uh, clients come by and I say, hi, Jimmy, you know, my neighbor. Um, I think those kind of very, I mean, actually old traditional elements of how we resided many years ago, I think that will come back. And uh, where the subject of wellness and community and fit together, um, if you, you know, so I, I think there's much more of this coming. And if you look at um, uh, the blue zones of the world, one of the things they have taught us that uh, is not only, you know, having the latest treatments and uh, the, the finest macrobiotic cuisine, but it's simple things like community sharing, eating together, um, you know, having a certain relationship uh, with some, some of the neighbors and the friends um, and, and being more active, like just walking around and puddling the garden and related is good for you. So I think uh, people will concentrate and or remember that and, and will concentrate and there will be developers who are offering this. And I can clearly see that there's more interest in that. It's interesting you'd mentioned people looking at villa spaces because apparently there was a rise in inquiries after the lockdown here in Dubai, which I understand was one of the most in, intensive in the world, that, that there was a, a rise in people looking for villas to rent with gardens, which is, it's a bit of a luxury here in Dubai to have any green space, although more developers are including it in our master plans. But yeah, I think Marley can probably agree to that, that most of us tend to live on the 16th floor and have some some pot plants outside. So I, I'm Martin, I'm guessing that in Portugal that it's the other way around. There's more low rise and less high rise spaces. So yeah, it's not maybe a trend that will come it, needs to come there. We we have our, our spots of um uh high rises that are, are undesirable. Um but just coming back to the, the original question that one of the trends we're finding is that we're seeing home cinemas being taken out of these medium to luxury villas uh, because Netflix has totally desecrated that. Uh, you know, you can watch a Netflix lying in next to the swimming pool. You can watch it uh, in your bedroom. So the use of a home cinema downstairs is no longer used. And uh, we've seen that a lot of people, a lot of inquiries coming in um, for home spa. And um, you know, now it becomes a family thing. Um, and it was quite interesting, uh, if you go back about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we suddenly saw this evolution of these American hot tubs, these portable hot tubs that just covered the world, a great product, dropped them on the terrace and the family got together, no mobile phones, and you just sat there and talked while you were having a massage in this hot tub. That's slightly gone out of uh, fashion at the moment, but I think now what's what's going to come in, into fashion in a big way and, and as a necessity is for home spas to be put into villas. And even if it's just a, a shower in the master suite, which is a sensory shower and it's a, a steam cabin and a tepidarium, um, you know, a good, a good steam bath once a week or twice a week will do the world of good. It's better than doing nothing. And it's that fear of having to go to a gym again. It's, it, it's all revolving around this whole COVID-19 until we find the virus. But I think we have to get used to it. As Ingo said, if it's not COVID and not HIV, it's going to be something else. And um, so we better get used to it and get healthy. Martin, do you find that clients, either private or commercially, are they expressing these concerns to you when they're asking, you know, for th these projects? Are they asking for antimicrobial materials? Are they talking about vitamin D because they've heard that it can be beneficial? Are they coming with arms with this knowledge or is this something you're helping lead them to as part of your role? I, I think the architects who are well well versed um, know know their products well, and they they will recommend um, certain products for for example, and and then for example our ourselves we inside a steam cabin or a hammam we will use a certain type of material that's antibacterial, um, which is you know ideal for that location um, and and gives a longevity of use and and. Uh, let's say your cleaning uh, regimes are, are drastically reduced. Ingo, are you, is that something you can echo? I saw you nodding there and I know we have our very own Cosentino project, products decked on and silostone for antimicrobial services. Is this something that, that the clients are coming to you with already in the brief? Um, 
Some do, some don't. Uh, I don't know. Let's say 50-50. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't okay. touched it. Uh, but uh, I can tell you the awareness of what they want and how they want it is substantially larger and bigger than it ever was. And that is good. What is, but what is not good is that many hotel companies, while they have jumped on the, I want to be, you know, I want to use uh, clinic materials, uh, which are of special grades and, and so forth and so forth, they haven't seen what they should do with their wellness uh, facilities. I have seen very few, uh, actually one in the UAE, yes, but very few who say, listen, we need to do something because our market is changing. And there's not enough of that yet there, but uh, but individuals and developers, yes, plenty, um, and uh, uh, large new projects as well. Um, but uh, I mean, the hospitality lives from catering to please and make healthy and make happy and make content and and give to people. Uh, that should be on on their on their forefront, and, and and I think there's more to be done. But then also, if you if you think about it, I mean, we just started four months ago, five months ago. None of us knew what COVID was. So I mean, that only, I mean, let's be patient. I mean, you know, this has just started. Uh, luckily, has just started. Uh, uh, luckily, it's uh, nearing some sort of you know getting a bit more normal and dealing with it better, and so. But um, so it's all new to us, no? To all, to all of us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a very different landscape we're going to see through into, you know, 2021 20, and further. Um, yeah. I wonder if it's just I'm going to bring us to our final discussion point before we look to any questions or anything um, that you guys want to wrap up with. The Global Wellness Institute um, projected that wellness tourism will grow at an average annual rate of 7.5 through 2022. Is that something that you can see expanding on what's happening in the industry at the moment? Can you see wellness tourism ever making a return and a successful return at that? Um, destination wellness resorts are very profitable if managed properly. They're, okay. much, they're much more profitable than luxury hotels. So okay. I... So I, I uh, I don't know if the number of 7.5 is, uh, is statistically right. Uh, yeah, I mean, statistics, and you can say anything with statistics, but let's say we're going to see a... a um, we we we're see, see a growth. Heavy growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100% Jane, there will be a substantial growth. I think the growth is going to be uh, much further enhanced to what has happened right now. And it's predominantly because there's a democratic process right now happening. A different market segment suddenly buys into this and wants that product. That hasn't uh, been there before. So I think it will grow. I don't know what kind of percentage, but it will grow more than airport hotels and uh, another 2,000 bedroom mice business convention center. Martin, is that something you you can echo? What's your um, I don't know if, how much experience you've had with the wellness tourism sector? I, I think um, one needs to ask a question, and that 7.5 percent growth uh, through to 2022 was issued at the end of last year. So it it it, it we we weren't taking on this nightmare of of COVID 19. Um, so, but I think we need to be optimistic about the the that figure and say well. Uh, let's look at the entire industry. Let's look at all the industries there. Um, probably wellness um, will pr grow the, the most out of all of them and show the a positive um, growth. Uh, because simply, we need to. We need COVID nineteen has, has shown us that we need to be healthy. We 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 have to start looking after our bodies. Our as 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 um, Melinia was mentioning earlier on, companies have to start looking after their staff. Um, healthier. Um, fit uh, people are far more productive in the in the companies. Um, you have less sick days, so I, th I think it's been a huge game changer, and it's 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 been a, I think a very welcome one because it's made us stop the hamster wheel we were on um, in the middle of March this year, and um, people are now starting to question a lot of things. So yeah, I think to answer the question, it it will it be seven point five, unfortunately. Um, wellness tourism is is piggybacking on the aviation industry, and I think the aviation industry around the world is an absolute mess. Um, they don't know whether they're coming or going. 
Um, so once they get themselves sorted out, then I think we can see it um, happening. But I think wellness is now on the radar for everyone in the family. Yeah, and certainly we see in the tourism industries open up here in Dubai. And I think that's one of the things when people certainly come on holiday that you, you you look at some downtime and relaxation. And I think now that will be that'll change into wanting to incorporate that into wellness and trying to keep fit. Um, Milani, I don't know whether there's anything you'd like to add to that. Are you seeing, you know, is that something that students are going to be looking at when they're um, you're working with them? Are we going to focus more on wellness rather than uh the luxury aspect of things? We have been. Um, st certain students are have already been looking more at mental well, uh, well-being than necessarily physical well-being. Um, it would be interesting to see. Um, a few students are currently working on projects and they were struggling with the idea of whether they should design for COVID and reduce the uh, capacity and whether they want to design, hoping that we find we found a vaccine and everything is normal. So it's a very, I mean, uh, it's very new. It's very early to be able to say whether we should design every space um, based around COVID and the the attachments that come around it. But I think more wellness is something that uh, students are going to address. Uh, natural light, and you know, how do you? make a person feel comfortable, especially in a place like Dubai, where the outdoor temperature can get extreme. Therefore, to counter that, we have very extreme indoor temperatures. So how do you manage to feel comfortable when somebody else really wants the air conditioning up high and you don't necessarily want that and you don't really want to have a cup of coffee, but you want to feel comfortable, you know? So these are, I think, more wellness than anything else, really. It's interesting we've touched on mental health because I guess part of getting people back into these wellness spaces is reassuring their mental health. Uh, at the moment, if you go out and people are wearing masks and, and there's, you know, bacterial sprays as you go into buildings, then that's also, I think, for some brings a sense of comfort that um, COVID is being dealt with and managed. So I guess that's something that brand hospitality might have to consider. How do you incorporate that into a, a relaxation space? How do you make people feel safe with your designs? Ingo, is that something that is part of um, what you're doing? Like how how is customer reassurance being provided via the client? One, I mean, important is that you communicate what you do, uh, that you not just do it because uh, the client needs to find out and needs to learn about it and know about it. Is this what you mean? You, that you need to communicate that and that you need to make it very clear through newsletters and through sign boards and through uh, verbal communication between staff and, and, and member or staff and consumer. And that's very, very important because you cannot assume that they anticipate that that is done. Uh, I can tell you in our um, uh, in our hospital resort in, in, in California, and we, we worked with Mark on this. Uh, Mark sits in my board, Martin, he's an amazing guy. Um, and uh, quite frankly, he was the one who, who said, listen, in, go, in mineral water, in sulfur water, and in saunas, uh, the virus cannot survive. And I said, really? It wasn't even known, you know? I mean, he as a scientist, as a, as a professor of integrative medicine knows this, but um, uh, I thought that I was uh, very well read and uh, knew all about it, but I did not. So, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we are doing has very good, has a very good impact on many different levels for our consumers, and I think we need to communicate as well. So, yeah, and I think that's an important message that these wellness spaces it's it's not just about luxury. That there's also, you know, I think Martin mentioned there'd been a study about how COVID could be killed off, in or certainly it could be affected positively by, you know, daily steam baths and saunas and that kind of thing. So. I think that's, that's an important smart, message for the industry as well. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, it, this has been really interesting. I've started this conversation just as a casual spa goer, and now I've ended it as I feel like I've gained a lot more knowledge and appreciation. Thanks to you all. Mm -hmm. Is there any topics that we haven't touched on around the subject as far as wellness space and new hygiene and safety protocols? 
Is there anything anyone would like to return to before I uh, pester our audience for questions? No, no I think one, thing, one thing we need, uh, but I don't think we can discuss this at length, but one thing we need, we need the growth of the industry is vast and we need many more people who have a substantial education in it and really have a passion for it and want to make this happen. I can tell you that, uh, I don't know about Martin, but I'm sure he is in the same boat. He has more jobs and sometimes he can find the right people who can accommodate and fulfill those jobs and who have the skill sets of technical skill set and you know soft skill set and deep know-how, but wellness at large. Uh, that, that's a problem because the industry has grown dramatically over the last you know, 20 years and that's or has been revived. Actually, it's not a new industry. The old Romans already did it, the Greeks did it. So we just revived it over the last years, yeah. Well, maybe that's where um, Milani and her academic colleagues can come in if they bring in through the next generation of interior designers. Then, you know, the the generation that comes up through through the doing that education through COVID, I think, will have a much, you know, it, it'll be ingrained in the design de design DNA for going forward. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, for the people in the audience, um, does if anyone has any questions, if you'd either like to type them in the box or if you want to turn your mic on and ask if you let us know who you're directing the question to or whether you're asking everyone on the panel, uh, that would be a big help. And yeah, don't be afraid to speak up. Does anyone have any questions? Um, while our shy audience uh, prepare their questions, um, I do I do have a question from our side. Um, in terms of uh, surfaces, um, is is the industry ready? Like you designers of spa and wellness areas, are you ready with all the materials you need right at this point mm -hmm. where cleanliness and, 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 and all these kind of, of, of viruses environments, are you ready with materials or do you feel like there is still a gap that it can be covered? I think Martin had a very good answer. I feel that I'm not as well prepared as he is prepared with the array of materials and precautions because I, for, for me, there's still a message which is uh, not as clear of what needs to be done because uh, just today I read that the virus cannot only go through um, uh, airwaves, but uh, it also uh, can survive substantially longer than we than we had earlier thought, and that one can re get reinfected uh, after uh, three to four weeks, uh, and it has a second COVID attack, even though one has developed an immune uh, uh, efficiency against it. So I, I I haven't fully understood what is what is happening to us there, and I would be lying that I have all the answers to what kind of materials to use. Having said so. Uh, self-cleaning materials, antiseptic materials, and so we know all this, but I, I think there's more to come, I think, as the industry, but I know that also Martin um, is very advanced there already in his, uh, in his knowledge. Um, thanks, Ingo. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, I, I mentioned right at the beginning of the of the webinar what what we're doing in terms of COVID nineteen, um, but I can say that you know we've been using silstone and um, in our spa designs for a very very long time, um, simply because you know when therapists are working with massage oils etc., we yeah. we need to make sure that these surfaces uh, can can remain with massage oil on there for 24, 48 hours if it's not cleaned off. Um, and won't won't affect the the um, the visual aspect of that treatment room. And the same goes for if you're having a hammam, etc. I think the, the most important thing you've got to worry about is is your anti-slip and your slippery surfaces. I mean, I've been in one or two hammams where the surfaces have been so slippery. The therapist has had a problem trying to you know ground me rather than me sliding off the the gobekatish or the hammam table, scrub table. So yeah, it's. Um, it, I think both architects, interior decorators, and consultants, operators need to be brought up to speed with all these um, uh, products. And now with the COVID nineteen, we we I think we all need to work together in trying to find the best way to to deal with this. Because, as you said, Ingo, 
every day is a new experience with COVID-19. Um, so I, we haven't yet handled this um, 100%, and we just need to go by trial and error, unfortunately. Correct. Agreed. Does that answer your question, Miriam? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Right. And thank you so much. Uh, I don't think we have any questions so far. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, normally we get a lot of questions uh, after when I send the session recorded. So when I get the questions, I will directly forward them to you. Um, so thank you again, Ingo, Martin, uh, Malini and Jane. Thank you so much for giving us um, uh, your time and for being part, and, uh, part of, of the Cosentino mission of bringing all this knowledge together and uh, bringing all uh, closer to the people, closer to that now they are sitting in their homes and, and, and just looking for more information and, and being close to everyone. Um, so that's it from our side. Uh, we have more events planned for the upcoming weeks. Uh, as Jane said at the beginning, this is our 14th edition, which means that it's been almost four months that uh, we've been with you every Monday with a different topic um, and uh, four uh, fantastic people in the, in the panel, like today. So um, thank you again from, uh, from the full Cosentino family. And I hope we can all see each other face to face, real face to face, uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you everyone for taking part. And I will be seeing, yeah, I'll be certainly seeing some of you again soon. Okay. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Bye-bye. Keep all safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.